Good afternoon and welcome. My name is Nalanjan Sarkar and I'm Deputy Director of the LSE South Asia Centre here at the London School of Economics. I'm delighted to welcome all of you to this afternoon's event. Uh, it's the first in a series uh, that we will be doing, and I'm just going to speak a bit about that, which we're doing in collaboration with the Bangar Patshala Foundation, which is based in Dhaka, and it, whose activities uh, and events aim to impact the public for a better understanding of issues of relevance and interest to Bangladesh. And we are delighted to get into this collaboration uh, with them. Our online events with the foundation will be academic conversations and will focus um, on the ideas of Sheikh Mujibur Rahman, the founding father of Bangladesh who led the country to independence and freedom in 1971, his vision, and perhaps their continuing relevance today. This afternoon's event focuses on Sheikh Mujib's economic vision and ideas and is titled Bangladesh since 1971, Economic Ideas and Contemporary Realities. I'm not going to say too much more about this because I'm just going to invite the founder and chairperson of the foundation to say a bit more. But before that, uh, please may I say a very big and warm welcome to all uh, members of the audience who have joined us online on YouTube. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for the interest that you have shown in the event, all of you who have written to me um, and all of you who have also got the link from uh, Bangar Patshala Foundation. Uh, we are delighted to have all of you. I know several of you are joining us from different time zones. So that much more thank you to those of you for whom it's an awkward time of the day or night or morning or whatever. Um, I'd also like to welcome uh, quickly Professor Koshik Basu and Professor Naila Kabir, about whom I'll say a bit more later on, uh, our speaker and our discussant to the event, both and thank them for their time and for their expertise that they, they will share with us uh, shortly. The event is happening via Zoom and is being live streamed on YouTube, as you know. Now, as you will see, uh, the chat function has been enabled uh, for you to ask questions. Please type your questions over there and uh, we will pose them. Um, you, you can pose a question either to the speaker or to the discussant. You can pose a question to both. Uh, if you would like, if you're posing it to a particular person, please mention them by name and we will I will post those questions in due course uh, once, once we've got over the initial part of the event. And uh, I should also say that had this event been happening on site at LSE, it is with the rule and regulation of LSE that members of the audience are uh, entitled to pose questions to speakers without revealing their identity. They don't necessarily have to tell their names uh, or to identify them. And while it is true that your names will be visible on YouTube, depending on how you have registered for it, when I post the questions, I will not be saying the names of the people who have asked them. I will simply post the question, right? Uh, if you would like to tweet, then you will see that the Twitter handles of the speaker, the discussant, Bangar Pachala Foundation, um, the founder, our center, they're all given. Uh, in the in the description of speakers that appears on your screen. So please do tag us. Uh, we'd be very interested to see your comments. Um, and we will we will take it from there. Now, without further ado, it is now my very pleasant task to introduce Ahmed Javed Chaudhary, who is founder and chairperson of Bangladesh Patshala Foundation, which is based in Dhaka. Ahmed does have a day job as well, I'm happy to say. He is assistant professor in economics at City University in Dhaka. Ahmed will speak briefly, after which we will get on to the main event. Ahmed, please speak now. Thank you, Nilanjan. I'm delighted to be part of this collaborative event with the LEC South Asia Center this afternoon. Bangladesh Patshala Foundation was born out of a commitment to education and enlightenment. And through our events, we aspire to disseminate these interconnected principles. The foundation's objective is to create a platform where knowledge transcends boundaries, where academic discourse is not confined to ivory towers, but resonates in the hearts and minds of our citizens. In a complex and interconnected world, our foundation strives to foster an environment where ideas flourish and where the essence of academic inquiry is accessible to all. We believe that education is the cornerstone of progress and our initiatives aim to bridge gaps, empowering individuals to contribute meaningfully to society. 
Our collaboration with LEC South Asia Center reflects our ambition to create such spaces for academic engagement in our shared belief that intellectual pursuits can be a catalyst for positive change. The event today with Professor Kaushik Boshu and Professor Naila Kobi is not just to discuss, but to also delve into the intellectual legacy of one of the greatest visionaries Bangladesh has ever known, Sheikh Mujibur Rahman. His ideas have not only shaped the course of our history, but continue to re reverberate in our academia, politics, and society. It is important to resonate the contemporary relevance of Sheikh Mujib's ideas. His vision for a just, inclusive, and progressive society remains a guiding light in our pursuit of a better Bangladesh. His ideas and principles are not relics, but the relics of the past, but relevant in our lives today. And I look forward to hearing and learning from what professors have to say today. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Javid. It's now my very pleasant task to introduce our speaker as well as our discussant. Professor Koshik Basu is Karl Marx Professor of International Studies at Cornell University. Professor Naila Kabir is Professor of Gender and Development at LSE and Associate Faculty at the International Inequalities Institute at LSE. Professor Basu will speak first for about 25 minutes and then Naila will speak. Professor Basu, please speak now. I made the mistake completely common to lectures on Zoom. I was speaking with mute. Thank you very much. It's an absolute pleasure to be with all of you, Nilanjun, uh, Ahmed Javed, Naila Kabir, uh, friends from a long time ago. And also it's a complete a pleasure for me to be back with my alma mater at one level, London School of Economics. So thank thank you once again, Banglar Patshala and uh, LSE for doing this. As was just pointed out, Bangabandhu Mujibar Rahman was not just a visionary figure for Bangladesh, but for the world. He meant a lot, his early ideas, his struggles, and there are lessons from that to be taken away. For Bangladesh, for sure, contemporary Bangladesh, but to be taken away around the world, around the globe. And we have to remember that while he was fighting for Bangladesh, it began with a language struggle. Those were central to his concern. He would repeatedly talk about, about humanism, the larger human identity. And that to me is actually resonant of the early founding of India, where the repeated references, yes, you need these identities of the nation struggling for that right now, it is important. But we also have to keep in mind the larger secular human identity, which is the dominant one. And that to me from Sheikh Mujibur Rahman rings loud and clear even today. You know, the story of Bangladesh, I will focus on the economy because that is my specialization, but I should tell you the founding of Bangladesh is for me very personal because um, I was a student in Delhi in 1971 when it all erupts. And we remember the courage. I remember the speech of 7th March, the famous speech which uh, resonated through the world. I remember in December 1971 when the war er, um, erupts with India getting directly involved. Seventh Fleet coming into the Bay of Bengal, uh, Richard Nixon sending that in. Those were times when I, as a student in Delhi, um, visiting Calcutta, my parents saw all this erupt. So it's very, very vivid memory for me for the founding of Bangladesh. Mujib's early vision, Bongo Bondhu's early vision, which he talks about in his book, The Unfinished Memoirs, where you can read bits and pieces of it, his belief in socialism. Socialism, the term was used, I should tell you, in a way very similar to the way it was used in India earlier. It's a kind of social democratic commitment. It's a commitment that when you are thinking of a nation's development, 
the focus be on the poorest from the bottom segment. It's a Rawlsian vision, which was used, the term socialism is a very general term being used for that vision. And you see it among some complete mainstream economists like Kenneth Arrow talking of socialism, talking of greater, better distribution of income, the government being engaged in those kinds of activities. And I think those in that spirit, it was the right way to initiate move. And we have to remember that in the early days, whenever you're bringing ideas to the table, and this I take this view for any leader, that the fact that we look up to the leader, admire the leader, does not mean that every policy being recommended by that person was right. There are mistakes we can say in India, we can look back at Nehru. I have a lot of admiration for his larger vision, but I can also point to that this policy move was wrong. That policy move was wrong. He was taking the best ideas from his time, but decades have moved on and we can look back and think of new ways to tackle these problems. I have with me here, depending on the time, I'll do that uh, beautiful quotations from uh, Sheikh Mujibur Rahman's book, The Unfinished Memoirs, where he's referring to Mahatma Gandhi on the Hindu Muslim brotherhood. There are just beautiful lines that resonate out of that and is worthwhile reminding us. But let me jump to the economy. That is the focus. And that is where I have to say my interest is that of a specialized interest rather than the general one. But I will come back in the end on the fact that the economy is embedded in politics, in sociology. These are old ideas that go back to Karl Polanyi. There are contemporary writers writing about that. And very often we mess up our economy because of a failure to appreciate this larger embeddedness. And that has to function well for the economy to function well. I will come back to that. Going back to Bangladesh's birth, you have to remember Bangladesh was born into grinding poverty. 1971, the per capita income of Bangladesh was $134. You realize what a long distance Bangladesh has come. It was $134 in 1971. Now it is 2,800. And I have to pause and tell you that when I was at the World Bank, it's a very memorable day. Bangladesh starts out in grinding poverty, as I'm uh, pointing out. There is uh, writings taking place that uh, there are lots of American documents that would be talking about Bangladesh being the basket case. You will have to feed, you will have to nurture, you will have to give aid, but you don't expect this country to become a strong economy. That was the writing all around. And for the first 10, 15 years, it was going like that. You have to remember that within three years of the founding of Bangladesh, there was a famine that hit, that devastated the country. So very little was seemed to have been happening for a good, say, I would say almost 20 years, and it remained flat. In fact, I have the data with me, but by 1995, Bangladesh's per capita income has risen only to $390. So all that happens, happens after that, but some, of course, important changes were taking place already. The dramatic movement of Bangladesh, I woke up when I was chief economist at the World Bank 2015, and we had data coming in from different countries, and some of my staff brought in data and said that, uh, Professor Basu, Bangladesh is moving up from a low-income country to a middle-income country. Lower middle-income country, but still a middle-income country. You know, because it was personal, because it's a country, the founding of which... I had seen as a student in my early days, it's a country that I followed very closely. It did come as a surprise. Bangladesh moving into the middle income category was difficult to fathom, but you have to remember, and I should put in a word over here about this being a completely professional exercise. World Bank is a description of some countries as low income countries, and then the crossover to middle income, within middle income, the World Bank puts in two categories, lower middle income, upper middle income. Uh, Bangladesh is in the lower middle income uh, uh, category. India is in the lower middle income uh, category. And then the upper middle income, upper, upper uh, higher income. These are done mechanically. There's absolutely no politics. The data pours in, you calculate, and you see a country has moved on. So when that news was brought to my desk in 2015, 
I said, do make sure that the data is right. And we made this announcement and we remember the celebration that was taking place because it was unthinkable that there would be this kind of a dramatic change. And going back a little bit, I want to come to contemporary challenges. That's where we have to put our heads together. But going back a little bit, I treat the years 1996 to 2000, I'm, and I've written about this, as the incubation period for Bangladesh. Growth still had not picked up that dramatically at 1996 to 2000, but there were important changes that were taking place. The manufacturing sector had started and was already doing well. Lots of reasons why Bangladesh has done so well in the manufacturing sector, some to do with complex political economy and inherited laws from the British period, which actually is the same inheritance that India, Pakistan, Bangladesh had. Bangladesh would later inherit this from Pakistan, but inherited. But there are some of those histories. If questions come up, I'll go into that, but I want to stay away from that into more contemporary times. 1996 to 2000, the telecom sector is beginning to take off in Bangladesh. And another thing which has played a very, very major role, Bangladesh's NGOs and the activism did uh, play a role in the empowerment of women, which I think has affected Bangladesh, the economy, quite dramatically. We don't get to talk about that when we are just focused on the economy, but many of the social uh, living standard indicators where Bangladesh has done extremely well, like life expectancy, nutrition, basic nutrition, a lot of it is to do with the empowerment of women. And that is to do with early NGO activity and also a lot of government activity, which was deliberately trying to empower women. And the effect of that becomes very, very visible some years later. Again, this is something that I've done some writing on. By 2001, Bangladesh's export growth is, uh, um, garment export is $3.1 billion. And more importantly, 1.5 million, pe million people are working over there. The dramatic story of Bangladesh is, I remember 2006, Bangladesh overtook Pakistan in terms of growth rate that Bangladesh is now growing faster than Pakistan. And the first thoughts were one or two years, e economic indicators fluctuate a lot from period to period and Bangladesh has overtaken it will drop down. But that did not happen. It's a sustained higher growth, Bangladesh from 2006. And within a couple of years, Bangladesh had crossed over Pakistan in terms of per capita income. Again, something that you could not have imagined earlier, and that has been sustained. After that, it has continued to be there. One of the important changes, uh, which economists, we economists pay a lot of attention, and uh, my friend, the Bangladeshi economist, Siddhi Kosmani, since this is being hosted, one of the hosts is the London School of Economics, Siddhi and I were classmates. Siddhi points out in many different places that the investment rate, the fraction of the GDP that you are investing in building up capital, in building up machinery, not just eating up, that investment rate plays a crucial role. We economists know that, we track that. I've got Bangladesh's figures over here right in front of me. 1970, Bangladesh is investing 10% of its national income. So very low national income. 90% is being eaten up. And in poor countries, that's only natural. 10% is being invested for the future. <clears throat> By 1990, this has risen to 20%. And now it is about 32%. It's like the early days of the East Asian Tigers. East Asian Tigers would reach high 30%. But Bangladesh is like the early days of over 30% of the national income being invested. No surprise, Bangladesh is growing very, very rapidly uh, and uh, doing very well. There are dangers right now, and I do want to keep a little bit of time to talk about this. At a, again, at a personal level, I remember my visit to Bangladesh in 2015, going to see these garment factories in Ghazipur. I did a visit. In many ways, it was a very striking thing. People were receiving their income digitally. Bcash had become common. And there are little indicators of social 
institutional progress and their connections with economy that I was getting at that time. In the olden days, as soon as you get your salary, workers lose a lot of time because they run to the bank, they get the money, then they have to remit it. There are de desperate needs at home. You are away from the factory floor where you're supposed to work. But now with the digital technology, you don't have to waste time on those things. You get it on your phone that your salary has come in. Come in. You immediately give an instruction that in this faraway village, I've got a relative, I've got parents, the money has to be transmitted over there. You do that in a couple of minutes, it's all done. It makes the space more fluid. And I remember also the factory floor look like a modern Western country factory. I'm sure that is not the case everywhere. And there's a lot to be done, but it was at a personal level, again, a very, very striking experience. I do want to spend a little bit of time on the current situation and the challenges that Bangladesh faces. You know, there has been, we know on the foreign exchange front about a year ago, Bangladesh was going through a very, very risky phase. I do think the right move was made to reach out to IMF on time. There's always a lot of stigma with reaching out to the IMF. India had done it in 1991 when the Gulf War destabilized remittance money coming into India. And with a lot of hesitation, India reached out to the IMF. A lot of criticism within India that, look, IMF is going to put in conditionalities on you that you don't want. But India had to go, no choice. And within about two years, that money was not needed anymore because India had stabilized. I like to believe something similar will happen. It was the right move to go to the IMF. Sri Lanka did not do that and went through a very, very turbulent period. And that's continuing to trouble the economy. Bangladesh has got a temporary stalling through the IMF coming in and pledging support. There, are, But there are challenges. Where do the challenges come from in the world today? I believe that there are several underlying changes taking place. Much of it, really, an individual country cannot do very much about. It's a hyper-globalized world we live in. Supply chains run through one country to another. And the kind of example we have to remember is in the olden days, if you had a thousand factories where cars are being produced, if one of them close, shuts down, one over 1,000th of the production stops. But in a supply chain linked economy, where one part of the car is being produced in Taiwan, the chips, another part is being produced in another country, another part in another country. If one factory closes down, the entire global production is going to be disrupted. And we are seeing that. And we've realized another thing, that supply chains are a war weapon. In the event of a conflict situation, you can say, I'll stop the production of chips and let me see how you deal with it. And you're disrupting the global economy. From the time of the COVID, which was unintentional consequence, but after that, we've seen the Ukraine war, right now the Middle East war, these are having dramatic ramifications around the world. And it's affecting the global economy. Many of the problems, you know, it's standard in politics, when you do good, you say, I've done it. When the economy does badly, you say someone else did it. But the truth is the economy is an extremely complex character. And what is good, what is bad, very often is beyond the control of a single individual, including the leader. It's complicated. We have to recognize that and put our best minds to it. One of the things that a leadership needs to do is to bring in the best minds to analyze. An unrelated example I must give you, the 1962 Cuban Missile Crisis, which President Kennedy, all said and done, handled superbly, that it was brought to an end without a war, no matter who wins, the fact that it was brought to an end without a war. And if you read in detail that period, one of the things that you get struck by is the amount of intellectual energy that went into the planning of how to handle this and Kennedy had a noting before that, because of his disaster in the Bay of Pigs, Kennedy had said, had written down that the disaster happened because I did not put enough time and attention and we did not bring enough expertise into analysis. He learned a lesson, brought in the best minds, 
drafting documents, plans about diplomacy and war. And the best way to solve a war is not to have a war. And that's how he solved the 1962 situation, which was on the brink of that. We need to put in similar kinds of expertise into today's world. The globalization has been talked about. There's very little an individual country do, but you have to prepare for that. One thing that is being talked about in the literature all around is that there might be deglobalization. That globalization may cease to move ahead because countries will put up barriers. They are worried. My own feeling is it's not going to happen. Globalization is the consequence of little technological advances taking place around the world. No one controls globalization. Globalization is almost as natural as gravity. It's a changing process, but almost a natural process. Scientists, engineers doing little innovations around the world is linking up our world. We have to live with it. If the world is going to get more globalized, and, and I'll give you one reason why in the United States, I get into this discussion. There are people who say that United States should put up barriers and not use international labor available in the world because American workers are being hurt by that. Yes, American workers are being hurt and things need to be done. But putting up barriers is not a solution for a very simple logical reason. If United States puts up barriers and does not use the cheap labor which is available around the world and begins to use its own labor, in the product market, America would have been outcompeted by other countries, which will use this cheap input and produce the goods cheaper. So in the product market competition, US will get outcompeted. So a country that resists globalization and puts up barriers will either realize halfway through that that's a mistake and change its policies or it is going to get outcompeted. So I think globalization is going to continue. Bangladesh has to position itself, keeping in mind that. Technology, technological advances is changing the landscape of the world and the demand for traditional labor is going down. This is no country's individual fault or matter of praise, but the demand for traditional mechanical labor is going to go down. I feel for low-income countries, middle-income countries, especially lower middle-income countries, there is still a period, maybe a decade, a decade and a half, where you can use the advantage of your cheaper labor, occupy that space, produce for the world. But gradually machines will come in, robots will come in, will begin to displace this. Then the global, there's going to be a global challenge. I hope the global leaders, the big countries will have the sense to come together, put their minds together. But in the meantime, the most important sector, which I'm glad was referred to earlier, uh, Ronnie did mention, uh, 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 Javed did mention, is um, education. I personally believe that education, the nature of education is going to be crucial. And allow me just to spend a few minutes to talk about this. And I feel Bangladesh ought to put in a lot of attention to that. It has done well in terms of education. It has brought in, which is the right policy to do. You have to bring in a certain amount of private sector into this play. The state cannot run it on its own. It's done all that, but there is still a distance to go. And I do believe that the future will belong to nations that open themselves up to modern education. One historical example. 1910, 1915, come to the Western world. A lot of people are writing and betting on Argentina. There's writing in United States that Argentina, which was then actually very close to United States in terms of per capita income, is going to overtake US and be the dominant economy in the world. There's a lot of Western writing about Argentina's rise. Over a period of about 20 years, that dream was shattered. United States takes off in a way which is historic. Argentina does not take off. A lot of writings on this has taken place. I believe that two things played a role, and both of these have been written about. Argentina went into a phase of hyper-nationalism, putting up barriers. It's not letting in outsiders come into the country, putting up tariffs. The hyper-nationalism, I do believe, 
hurt Argentina. It was resisting globalization in a very artificial way. But even more important than that, education. United States people talk about its hard power. I personally have much greater respect for the soft power because the United States began investing in higher education, basic education, creative education, scientific education in a big way. And even literature and, and, uh, and writings, education is a very, very complex overall whole was being stressed. And that takeoff in education and the education sector, I feel underpinned America's economic growth. And of course, it did many other things, but that plays a role. But allow me a few more minutes to talk of embeddedness with which I started. An economy does not function on its own. It's not just fiscal policy, monetary policy, and antitrust law that drives the economy. An economy is embedded in a political ethos. An economy is embedded in social structure, in institutions. Whole lot of people have written about this and talked about this, but we very often forget that those things are important. And to me, again, it's a hard process. Democracy, secularism, I actually value these as ends in themselves. I think they are important to think of the world as our most important identity is our common human identity. Democracy, where you give people voice, are important. I know these are difficult times to navigate and keep these things nurtured. And very often you get short-term benefits on the economy by stamping over these. And economic history is complex enough. There will be exceptions. One country that has done well by tramping, trampling over these. But by and large, these qualities of embedding an economy in a democr democratic system where ideas are coming in all over and education flourishes in a democratic system in the long run because that space is needed is extremely important. The larger human identity is an Im important in itself. And I believe that there are certain economic indicators like investment depends on some of these things which are difficult to quantify. Trust among human beings. How much you invest in the future, you put away your money for the future, depends a little bit on your confidence about the future. And trust, which has been written from Francis Fukuyama to contemporary writers, and there are laboratory tests that have been done. Trust is a very, very important underlying characteristic for an eco economy to progress. For these, there are no easy solutions that do this, and the trust will be better. But if the leaders are aware of this, they bring in the best minds, they know that it's difficult, that we put the minds together to nurture these qualities, a country can do well. Bangladesh has done remarkably well, something which we could not have imagined in the 1970s, 1980s, till the early 1990s. Then it took off. If you look at that graph, earlier I had some PowerPoint, but I thought I'll save time not by putting it up. Per capita income graph goes like this, and then it takes off like this. It's an unbelievable change. So it's gone through a remarkable phase. We must not jeopardize that story, bring in the best minds, give emphasis to education, create space for creativity and novel ideas to be brought to the table. And there are many other nitty gritty ideas, which in smaller conversations I would go into, I would write about. But today, let me stop here. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Basu. Th thank you so much. That was absolutely wonderful. I'm not going to take uh, too much time in thanking you right now. Uh, so I'm just going to invite uh, Professor Naila Kabir, who's Professor of Gender and Development at LSE and Associate Faculty at the International Inequalities Institute at LSE. Naila really needs no further introduction than that. But Naila, please speak now. And we do have some questions coming in. Please keep your questions coming in. And I will post those questions in due course. But Naila, please speak now. Okay, thank you very much, Koshik. That was very thought-provoking and wide-ranging and comprehensive. Uh, I think you should keep your video on, Koshik, so I'm talking to somebody. Otherwise, I feel like I'm talking to myself. <laughs> okay, the first thing I want to say is I found it very useful uh, the way that you um, explained what Mujib understood by socialism. Because I've always puzzled over, because I haven't read his book. I haven't yet got hold of it. 
And I've always puzzled over what exactly was socialism doing as one of our constitutional pillars. I do know that the left were very active in the war for liberation, and I know that he respected and had many colleagues and so on, but he was not a member of the Communist Party, he was the Obama League. But translating it and telling us that Ken, Kenneth Arrow also talks about socialism, translating it into this broader, broad vision of social justice, of social, a social democratic view of social justice, actually makes a lot of sense. And I think, I don't know if I want to credit uh, Mujib with it, but the idea that the state has a responsibility for people, I think has been a lasting uh, trope right through the history of Bangladesh. And I think it began with independence. One of the things I thought when I was listening to your uh, uh, exposition about what Bangladesh has done well, um, is that I think Bangladesh stands out as an example of an economy where progress was due to the interaction between the social and the economic, between the human, human development, human issues, and investment and the economy. So although growth did not really take off to the 1990s, one important thing that happened was that fertility started to decline slowly in the 70s and then much more rapidly. So that, you know, whatever growth rates we had translated into per capita estimates, which were far higher than they would have been if we had continued to have the kind of fertility uh, rates that we had. I also think that the issue of, you know, infant mortality, child mortality, all of those things were beginning to improve before the 1990s. So in a sense, they were laying the foundations for uh, people to start thinking about the future in a way that they might not be able to do Were they worrying about how many children to have, how they bring them up, were they going to die, and so on. So there's a sense in which I think some of the social achievements, the human achievements that Bangladesh was able to report before growth took off, laid the foundations for what did happen. So I think that was very important. Secondly, I've always been quite interested in the way that a country that was made up of, and we, you know, after the partition, the kind of feudalism that we had uh, in the past went with the Hindu landlords going off to, to Bengal. And what we had is a nation of smallholder farmers, of peasants. Those peasants are today entrepreneurs. You know, self-employment is the biggest source of employment in Bangladesh. Some of it is major uh, enterprises, the garment sector, etc. But I was quite intrigued to read that, you know, growth in Bangladesh owes a great deal to the garment sector, but it also owes a great deal to international migration, and it owes a great deal to uh, non-farm, the growth of the non-farm sector. And within the growth of the non farm sector is livestock and others. And I find that interesting because, of course, if you look at who is looking after livestock in Bangladesh, it is women. And a lot of it is through microfinance. So I think what Bangladesh, I think why it's translated into fairly broad based growth, you know, rather than being concentrated, the benefits being concentrated in a very small group of people, it is highly concentrated. But, you know, we have seen uh, nutrition and so on and so forth improve across the board and also in a very poor, poor, poor way. So I think um, it is the pattern of growth, I think, that has been quite important. It's diversification. That it has, yes, it has had the garment sector and everybody talks about it, pharmaceuticals, shrimps and so on. But it's also had this off-farm diversification. You know, people have stayed in the countryside and managed to earn living. So all of these things, I think, are worth studying in greater detail. I think microfinance has had a huge role to play in the off-farm economy and the diversification of the off-farm economy. So I think there's an interesting transition of peasants into entrepreneurs of various kinds, which I'm not, I don't know if that is, you know, if we see that in other parts of the world. I wanted to pick up your on your point about education. 
I have to say, you know, I've been looking at what has what has been the role of women in the in driving progress, social progress. You know, women still have very limited labor force participation rates if we count paid work or, or waged work, but they are they are very active in various kinds of self-employment, including livestock. So I think one of the things that has been extraordinary for me is the extent to which education has been identified by a lot of ordinary people as one of the most transformative interventions that the government could have done. And the government has done a lot. It has you know, provided food for education, scholarships for girls, and so on and so forth. And when you look at the statistics, particularly, and I'm interested in women, when you look at the statistics on what education, you know, what female education, maternal education translates into, both in terms of, um, you know, women's empowerment and so on, but also in terms of the well-being of the family, uh, pulling people out of growth. So I guess there's what, there are two kinds of stories we can tell about what has happened in Bangladesh. There is the big picture story. I, I think it's the one that you told about investment and so on. And then there is a small picture story about all the ways in what was happening in the big picture translated into progress on the ground, but in turn, progress on the ground translated into the changes that made up for the big picture. You know, people going off into the wilderness, you know, going off all over the world, you know, wherever you go in the world, you will find a Bangladeshi trying to sell you something. And they come back and their remittances are, you know, a part of the growth story. Wherever you go, and, and there are many women who migrate, wherever you go in, in uh, different parts of Bangladesh, you will find women investing in their children and in their daughters so that they will have a better life. So along with all that's happening on the macroeconomy, there are these struggles at the lower level, at the, at the ground level, for people seeking to change their destinies and have at least their children should have better lives. And I think that's been a, a, a... I actually telephoned someone who I know works on education. You know, that's what she does. I wanted to know, has anyone studied how education translates into transformation beyond getting people jobs? You know, it is not just about... It's, it's Sen's idea of capabilities. You know, how does... Even poor level education translate into these very uh, major leaps and bounds in people's imagination about what they can do with their lives. So I thought that was interesting as well. And uh, when you talk about the future, you know, I do hope Bangladesh invests in its people, invests in its uh, education, but also invests in the quality of the education that will equip people to meet whatever challenges are coming around the corner. There's one point I want to end on. You know, you talked uh, about investment and so on. I would like to see more. I can see that globalization is not going to be reversed in a hurry. And as a small country, I don't know if we can afford to go. Target. But I do would I would like to see, uh, you know, more of a domestic base. I would like to see the, the government developing more of a domestic industry. That is not so reliant on global. And I guess there it's the issue of the tax rate. You know, I think Bangladesh and maybe other South Asian countries do not tax their wealthy sufficiently. It's almost like a matter of course that you avoid tax. And I don't know what the rate is, but, you know, I think it's like 8% of GDP or 9% of GDP. And I don't know how far we can go to maintain the kind of poor, poor growth that we've had without investing more in uh, the domestic capabilities of the country. It's, in, it's, it's industrial capabilities, it's educational capabilities, and above all, it's health capabilities. Because that's where I think we still have a long way to go. You know, I think COVID revealed some of the weakness in our health system. So I'll end there, but I really, you know, I find the Bangladesh a very fascinating story about how the social and the human were a critical element in the story of the economic. That's it.
Um, just, sorry, do you want to do you want to go ahead and speak, Professor Basu? I should tell you we've had a fire alarm, so we've had to come out of our building. But please go ahead and speak, and I will pose the uh, questions to you shortly. <laughs> Good. I'd love uh, just uh, four or five minutes to respond a little bit to what Naila was saying. It touches so close to my interest that I can't give up on that opportunity. Thank you, Nilanjan, but be safe. Switch this off if there's sufficient need for that. Okay. Uh, let me, Naila, um, touch on a, a few of the things. The Your last comment on taxing the rich. I strongly believe in that. For your country, my country, for the world, and I've been writing repeatedly, the inequality is out of bounds. And we have to do something about that. And for me, the biggest reminder, there are political debates that, you know, it's uh, through hard work that people become rich. Yes, some of that happens, but vast amount of inequality is people who are, people are born poor and some people are born rich. And since at the time of birth, it's not your hard work that is being rewarded or your laziness that is being punished. It is you're being born poor and born rich and this needs correction. And we do need a much heavier taxation on, of the rich to transfer that money to the poor. I will put in a couple of caveats. This is something that needs careful planning. A little, quite a bit can be done by individual countries. Within the country, you can begin to tax the rich much more and begin to transfer that uh, as support for the poor. And I do believe Bangladesh should do that. I believe in a hefty wealth tax because at the time of birth, you are not the person who ordained that you'll be poor or you'll be rich. There should be a big transfer that should be done. One thing that has to be kept in mind and a country has to do this intelligently. If you go for very heavy taxation and transfer from the rich to the poor, you will have flight of capital and individuals leaving your country and growing elsewhere. So I do make a case that the whole world, we are at a stage we need to get together and have a much bigger taxation system that the world does it together. But we cannot wait endlessly for that. Each country has to navigate this intelligently. Don't overdo it so that you begin to lose your capital flying out of your country. But there's a lot that you can do without overdoing it. So thank you for bringing that up. And I just want to touch on the early thing you mentioned, Ken Arrow. Ken Arrow has this paper called A Cautious Case for Socialism. Ken Arrow is a mainstream American economist. I think one of the greatest minds uh, out of America, out of the world. This paper is worth reading because at one level, it's a bit of a misuse of the term socialism. It's not that he's saying that the nation should go and take over uh, uh, all capital, but it's a social democratic case being made. And in fact, a lot of early writings of Nehru emphasizing socialism, Mujibar Rahman referring to socialism, seems to me it's that use of the word. Very often the ultra right wing group will sort of put it all under the same umbrella, take the same word and put it all under the same umbrella. So then you can begin to bash it, but you have to remember this nuanced view. And finally, I, I should just tell you, I completely believe that the changes on the ground that were taking place or beneath the ground almost, in the early years played a very major role. And there was a study in world development. Now I'm forgetting you may be one of the authors of that, so I should not quote that back, which points out to the fact that in Bangladesh, you required the people who are receiving money, that time receiving money from Grameen Bank, that households that received money, the women would have to go out and go to the village um, uh, level meeting, representing the household and talking about this. This small empowerment of women that they are going outside the home, sitting at a village meeting and talking, that began to have effect on the household. The children's nutrition would improve. They would come back and have greater say in the household. Those children would grow up to work in more effectively. So the long run effect of these tiny little social changes, Bangladesh has reaped a lot of benefit from that. Some of these little social changes are at times inadvertent. You don't even know you're doing something good because the benefit will come 10 years later. I'm glad you stressed that because Bangladesh got a lot of benefit on that. And one more point I do want to make education. It's not just making people cram and learn the same thing. The nature of education is changing. So it's not just saying, let's just have more schools and train people in the same way. You have to bring in modern education so that people are ready to take on the creative space 
which is where human beings will have to function because the mechanical work is going to be taken away by labor. So you want to create and nurture the creative mind whereby you will have intellectual property, intellectual space. That's what that's the kind of education you need to develop. I'll stop with that, Nirajan. Um, thank you very much. Uh, I'm just going to speak a bit loudly there. We have a few questions, uh, but Naila, you are also very welcome to uh, come in once again if you'd like to, but I thought we could take a few questions. My apologies to the audience uh, members, but I've had to come out of my office and sit in another building. Uh, but there is one question, Professor Basu, for you, which says, and I'll read it out directly, what are the promising future sectors that Bangladesh should invest in? What is the prospect of a country like Bangladesh in the technology sector? And what steps should they take? You need to switch on your microphone. Yes, that's a standard uh, uh, trigger that needs to be pulled by someone waving. Thank you, Naila, for doing that. Um, I, I don't want this to be a sort of final statement on which sector, because for that you need a lot of detailed study of Bangladesh. But there are some areas where I do have a view. I feel in the pharmaceutical sector, where Bangladesh has already done pretty well, Bangladesh can do very, very well. It can become a dominant uh, player in the world. India's doing, India's done phenomenally well in the um, pharmaceutical sector, but Bangladesh also has that opportunity. It's come up very well. It's virtually self-sufficient. It provides a certain amount to the world. This is a sector where I also feel that the global intellectual property rights will get redefined because I feel the whole world is feeling now, especially after the COVID happened, that you need the participation of the full world. So there will be more space and Bangladesh has already made a little bit of headway and can get into this in a very, very big way. All kinds of artificial intelligence, high tech sector is going to grow. There are the countries around the world that are beginning to invest in that. Bangladesh has done, again, I mentioned the telecom sector, which is very early in Bangladesh. Be ca your uh, mobile cash, Bangladesh is among the forefronters, uh, of, uh, for in the forefront of that. It's a sector that needs to be developed. And finally, and I'm, I'm coming back to this education. There's another role that can be played by emerging developing countries. Providing education in a rich country, in a country like United States, where I'm sitting, is a phenomenally expensive activity. You have to spend a huge amount to buy education in the United States. I feel for a lot of emerging economies which have had the fortune of early investment in education, you can become a supplier of education for the world. People are unaware uh, because uh, uh, China uh, makes news in other ways. China has already made strides into that. There are people from developing countries going to China and China does not have a language advantage because English is the language you have to use. You don't have to love the language, but that is the language that is globally used most. Bangladesh has that advantage. India has that advantage. These are countries which can become global hubs which are providing education, training people from other countries. So there are these sectors, uh, some of these I mentioned, but if you do a detailed study, I'm sure there will be others. And this is the kind of thing where I'm, again, going back to Kennedy, you need to bring in the best minds, make them sit together, work out the details and say, these are the three, four sectors where we are going to put in special effort and money and the state has to play a role in providing that leadership. Uh, Nanjan? Yeah, sure. Go May ahead. I just uh, pick up on this? I, I wanted just, to say yeah, I want to say something that uh, I wanted to talk to the audience about something that uh, about the pharmaceutical sector because it's something that uh, you know I, I've been following, and that is Bangladesh has got a very healthy pharmaceutical sector, but it happened almost inadvertently. It happened when Dr. Zafullah Chaudhry in 1982, when Ershad was in power, persuaded him to pass the essential drugs policy. At that time, the pharmaceutical companies in Bangladesh and internationally went for him because he was, you know, interfering with market forces. But in a way, what he was doing is providing the infant industry type protection that let Bangladeshi pharmaceutical companies provide essential drugs for the country. And I think today, a lot of the pharmaceutical companies actually thanked Dr. Chaudhry for having given them the space to flourish 
And I think they are now, not only is Bangladesh relatively self-reliant in its essential drugs, but I think it's also exporting. So these are one of those unanticipated, partly unanticipated outcomes of a commitment to a principle. Thank you, Naila. Thank you, Naila. I just wanted to say, was there anything you wanted to say in response to the initial uh, reply that uh, Professor Basu gave to your um, comments? Anything else you wanted to add to that? Or we can take up another question. No, no, not really. No. Okay, okay. Um, we, can yeah. come back. we can come back to that. So Naila, this question is for you uh, from, from a member of the audience, which says, in which ways was Bangladesh effective in eradicating or lessening the, the influence of feudalism? What role do you think the 1974 Bangladesh famine had on its economic state today? Um, I think, you know, Bangladesh up till, probably up till partition in 47, was a country of small farmers who were tenants to larger landlords. You know, people who used to be tax collectors under the Mughal system were turned into landlords by the British permanent settlement. And many of these landlords, the people who benefited from the system were Hindus and may have lived in Calcutta, may have lived in uh, Rabindranath Tagore, for instance. And in 47 meant that it wasn't so much, there had been struggles against uh, you know, the, the Pebaga movement and so on, you know, against the conditions under which small peasant farmers were. I was thinking earlier when I made the comment about tax, but is, is it that we have a problem that tax is not a part of our culture? But of course, people have been paying tax in the countryside, you know, from the British, from the Mughals, etc. So tax is very much a part of the culture. But they were being taxed with no returns. So that, that tax was going to the state, it was going to the British and so on. And it wasn't coming back. But in 47, when a lot of those landlords disappeared, there was a moment where we could have become much more equal, egalitarian, in the sense that there was a land stealing act and so on passed. But I think the larger farmers in Bangladesh, uh, Bengali farmers, bought up the land, took over the land that was left by the Hindus and so on. So what we got was not feudalism, but we got a very unequal distribution of land, which has become less and less equal over time. So, the, so there have been struggles against feudalism, but it was partition that actually ended it in Bangladesh. And we have been fortunate that the people who then took over, fortunate in the sense the people who then took over were, if you like, enterprising peasants rather than people with hereditary rights to the land. And I think what 74 did, and what 1974 did, and I hear I want to quote Naomi Hussain's book, is that for any government to be in power at a time when people are starving is a shock to the system. But this was not the first famine that Bangladesh had had. I think this is the first famine that happened when the people who were in power were also Bengalis. Bengalis who came from the countryside, Bengalis who understood what was going on. And I think that was a, a real um, a wake up call. And I think I really agree with Naomi's uh, uh, your argument that subsequent governments, Mujib onwards, have been determined never to let famine come back to Bangladesh. And I think we are now self-sufficient in food. <clears throat> I think Koshik said, and I want to be very cautious about anything we say about Bangladesh because it could all change overnight. But at the moment, I think we are fairly self-sufficient in food and, uh, you know, hunger and nutrition has been improving very dramatically. Again, we're held up very often as how is this happening. As I think to some extent, it's, uh, you know, economic inequality, but social homogeneity of the country. It allows a lot of things to travel very fast because it doesn't have to leap over the hurdles of caste, feudalism and so on. So I hope I've answered the question. Thank you. Thank you very much, Naila. Um, I just wanted to ask uh, Professor Basu, did you want to say anything about the 1974 Bangladesh famine, the impact it had on the economic state today? Uh, uh, Nilanjan, not on uh, that, um, but I wanted to pick up on one thing that um, Naila said. So I'm, I'm happy with Naila's analysis of the 1974 famine, which was actually of 
also changed uh, uh, Bangladesh a little bit. I think globally it realized because you have to remember in the middle of that, United States cut off some food supplies to Bangladesh uh, using it strategically because of Bangladesh's relations with Cuba. So there was also geopolitical implications of that for Bangladesh, there was a learning involved. But can I pick up on one point I wanted to make, how history has parallels. You talked to Naila just now of the pharmaceutical industry and unintended effects of uh, uh, policy interventions. There's a parallel in India, India's information technology sector. The massive takeoff that took place from the early 1990s with uh, um, yeah, Infosys, Azim Premji's, Wipro, et cetera. And th that sector really made a big difference to India. It was really inadvertent policies in the past. In 1978, I may be getting this one year wrong, um, um, IBM was thrown out of India. It was a protectionist policy. So at one level, it was like the infant industry argument. The sector is protected. It's developing on its own, but you also needed the opening up. So it got a period of protection through this uh, 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 policy, a somewhat nationalistic policy that we don't want outside competition. Then in 1991, when the reforms came and the economy opened up, the infant industry had been nurtured and matured and then IT takes off. From what you're saying, the pharmaceutical sound, sounds very, very similar in Bangladesh. Thank you very much. Shall we uh, take the next question then? It's uh, comforting to see your back, Nilanjan, in your office. I, my apologies I'm to, to everyone and members in the audience as well, but we had to run out to another building, which was the Students' Union building, so which is why you could hear the sound in the background. But my, my apologies uh, very much. It, this is really not in our control. Um, we have another question, which is to both of you. Uh, uh, Naila and to Professor Basu, to you as well. What percentage of GDP needs to be invested for growth in education like the early 1900s in the USA? I'm going to let Koshik answer that because I have no idea. <laughs> Naila beat me to it. I was about to say I'll let Naila answer that, but she's beaten <laughs> I me mean, um, uh, to this. Let me just say, yes, I'm not going to give a percentage number. But generally, I can tell you in terms of investment to GDP, it's ideal for me is just looking at the East Asian countries, uh, uh, say uh, Korea, uh, economies like uh, Taiwan, uh, their take off Singapore. You want investment rates to be pushed to close to 40%. Between 35 and 40% really powers the economy to grow. And there's a lot of evidence. This does not translate immediately into benefits because investment to growth, there's a lag of a couple of years. Bangladesh at 32% is very close to breaking into this real high investment category, which was the Asian Tigers used to have that. Within that, the question pertains to education. I can't quite tell you how much of this should be education, but one of the things I'm glad the question was asked is, you know, one of the biggest investments, and this is going to change, is investment in human capital. Investment is not just spending time on building machines, time and money, but also spending time and money on building the human mind to take on this new world. So it's very difficult to give a figure because this is a change landscape where human capital investment as a part of inv investment itself has to grow. Within that, the human capital investment is going to become even bigger. So I won't give a number to that, but I'm glad that this awareness and the stress on this is there because I think countries will have to do a huge amount. You are seeing countries like Vietnam and all investing in a very big way into this. Bangladesh has done moderately well, but needs to do a lot more in this basic educational investment. Could I just add on that? I mean, we're talking a lot about education and obviously education has a very direct bearing on you know growth and so on. But I really want to make the case for health, because when we're talking about human capital, human capabilities, you know, India has this um, midday meal scheme, which is premised on the idea that if children are hungry, they can't concentrate on their lessons. If children are ill, if people are ill, their ability to take advantage of their education is going to be restricted. And I think this is where Bangladesh, you know, we made a lot of progress on health through these vertical programs, you know, low-cost vertical programs. But I think it's now time to go horizontal. 
they really, all countries, and if we want to go back to this idea of socialism, central to socialism must be state responsibility for basics. And that means, you know, basic healthcare. And I would really, you know, I believe in education, but I think prior to education, I think we need to invest in health. And it's building on a healthy population, healthy children, healthy parents, and so on. But I think education will have its biggest payoff. So um, I think education, and I know this is not true of you, Koshik, but economists tend to talk about human capital in terms of education, but they often forget the foundations of education are in people's ability to be nimble, agile, creative, you know, cognitive. The cognitive skills are to do with education, with health. Completely agree with that. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I was putting it under the same umbrella, but yes, it is in a foundational matter. Great. We have a few more questions, but I was going to ask Javed, do you have any questions? Um, would you like to, do you have any questions? You need to put your mic on. Yeah. Um, no, I don't have really. I, I, I'm enjoying their discussions and enlightening myself. Okay, great. We'll take a few more questions that we have. We're all enjoying it and, and being enlightened. So great. But if you do, uh, please come in uh, whenever you need to. Yeah. Okay. So we're going to take another question, which is to Professor Koshik Basu. The government has recently taken a new education policy. Okay, I'm going to read this once before I... I imagine it means uh, the government has recently introduced a new education policy without any prior feasibility study. What should be the role of NGOs and civil society to make the government understand the importance of this sector? Which I assume means the education sector, which I think you've sort of answered or spoken about in some detail, but that's the question. Yeah, you know, it's um, it's 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 difficult for me to go into the details of this because I don't know how sensitive the government is being to outside views and criticisms, suggestions. All I'll say is, as um, Nilanjan just said, this is part of the broader comment that I was making. The new education policy is important. But it is important also to realize that to get the right policy in place, you do need to bring in the best minds uh, to think about what uh, this new education policy should be about, because it's so intertwined with the country's growth. As, as Naila just pointed out, beneath the new educational policy is also the new health policy. You do want people to be nurtured well so that they can take in this education. So these are complex matters. I don't know the details of the policy that have been worked out, but I do know from the experiences of, of other countries in totally different areas, from war, diplomacy to intricate economic policies, that you need to spend time on bringing best ideas to the table, then take tough decisions and push them into the society, Occasionally, life is so complex, you will make a move without realizing its long-run effect. And the pharmaceutical uh, industry example that Naila gave and the uh, IT sector example I gave from India, these were inadvertent moves which had long-run effect. We just want that as our mind develops, more and more of these will be deliberate moves because we understand the economy better, we understand the world better, and we take better decisions. So all I will say is that you do want to bring in the best minds debate discussion. There will be mistakes. You can't stop forever taking a decision saying that, well, we are not 100% sure in life. You will not be 100% sure. You'll have to move on, but make the best effort to bring in the best ideas to the table. And as John Maynard Keynes, that in the long run, it is ideas more than anything else which drives progress or good or bad. It is ideas that drive a country and a society. Thank you. Uh, I was just going to I was just going to say that I'm uh, it's it's curious that no one is asking a question that goes back to to uh, Sheikh Mujib's ideas with with. Well, can I can I bring come in on that? Oh, please do, please do. I I I um again I really was thinking about Sheikh Mujib's ideas, and I think you know education more even than health. I think is the place where ideas are born, where ideas are gestate, where ideas are shaped. And I think Bangladesh would do well to recall the principles of democracy and secularism. If we want an educational system 
that is humanistic, that is, you know, that positions Bangladesh to make the best of its human resources, then that educational system should be informed by the principles of secularism and democracy. We need to create new generations of citizens who know that they have to pay their tax, <laughs> who know that they are responsible for each other. So I think the technical side of education is hugely important. But I think also the investing in the cre construction of the next generation of citizens is it will stand us in good stead in the future. So I want to go back to Mujib's principles about secularism and democracy. Okay, we uh, do. Have yeah. Sorry, yeah, go on, go on. Can I take advantage of uh, Naila's comment and actually read out one sentence from Mujib's uh, memoirs, where, where in those early, this is, you have to remember, I think he's writing about this is uh, in the early days of Pakistan, where he's say, saying that, I'm quoting, the country was reeling under corruption, oppression, and tyranny. Instead of concentrating on rational schemes for development, the government was developing its energies to the politics of conspiracy. The people in power were indulging in bureaucratic rule and intrigue-based politics. He's talking of Pakistan those days, but it is a reminder of certain principles that Mujib was very, very aware of. Thank you. We do have a question that does hop back to, in fact, to pre-Sheikh uh, Mujib times and concerns education. This is for both of you. Um, what is the historical trend in Bangladesh regarding the part of the population that can access quality or higher education since 1920, which is the establishment of the University of Dhaka? This is for both of you. Can you repeat that question? Sure. Um, um, what is the historical trend in Bangladesh regarding the part of the population that can access quality or higher education since 1920, which is marks the establishment of the University of Dhaka? Either of you go first. I was letting, uh, I will make a comment of India because uh, then uh, the Bengal also comes in, but let, let Naila take on because I don't know enough really of the long run uh, Bangladesh history on this. Well, I would say that we arrived in 1971 with very low levels of even basic education. I would say that the vast majority of people had very, very low education. It is since 71, since the, the rule, you know, since Bangladeshis took over the government, that there was much more importance. I think Mujib set up almost in 71 or 72, a commission to look at what kind of education does a country that is going to be modern, forward-looking, secular, and so on and so forth, you know, and the Kudutullah the Commission came up with the basic principles of, and it looked at gender and it looked at, you know, all of these other areas and, and it looked at the technical side. But I think up till then, it was, it was a small elite that was the, were able to take advantage of, uh, of university education, higher education. Uh, yeah, that's, that's my impression. Let me just jump in because uh, it is ve very similar point I was going to make that if you look at uh, Bengal and the early education, uh, Calcutta, uh, for instance, and similarly Dhaka, uh, it's absolutely outstanding, the elite education. And one must not discount that because I feel that really empowers society. So you don't want to take anything away from that. In fact, I worry now that we are not putting in enough into that elite education, which produces scientists, writers, and that actually influences society. But this was true of Bengal then and true of India in general, and I'm sure it's similar to Bangladesh. It is a very polarized education system where the top end is getting top quality education and not for a moment do you want to do any redistribution over there, but you want to educate 
wider base much better. And this deficiency in Bengal was also very visible that the elite education is really at an international level taking place. The world's best scientists and writers coming out. This is true of Bangladesh, India, historically, when it is a common land. But the ba basic education was very poor. And we should admit that and going ahead, try to rectify that and pull the large segments of the population into this. Great. Thank you. We have 10 ish more minutes. Um, and uh, I'm going to take two more questions. Um, one is about the famine. I'm just reading this first. In the aftermath of the famine, were there noticeable shifts in economic activities, resource allocation or development priorities? This is for both of you. I will have to pass this. Uh, yeah. Okay, well, um, very soon after the famine, which was in 74, I think a year or so later, was the assassination of Mujib. And a period of huge turbulence and a shift away from some of the principles <clears throat> that had been laid down under Mujibism towards a fairly abrupt turn to um, opening up markets and so on and so forth. You know, the neoliberal uh, um, formula. But I think what, what is, is, is remarkable or what is noteworthy is that the state did not withdraw from the provision of social welfare. You know, we did have... Um, the continued food for work programs, and they have continued over time. We had a lot of international money coming in after Mujib was assassinated. So, you know, organizations like CARE, and we saw NGOs. And I suppose that's not the government, but I think the, uh, the state has been commended for allowing NGOs the space to flourish and pick up deficits in state capacity. So what we saw, I think, uh, already there were organizations like BRAC and, and Ramin came in 76, who were beginning to, if you like, supplement the state, but also make up for some of its deficiencies. So a lot of the welfare provisioning that went on after 74, you know, in terms of, uh, of health and education and so on, was done either under contract from the state or by NGOs working on their own. But it was actually pointed out that the first experiment in food for education and scholarship skills were tried out well before democracy was restored. So, you know, seeds of change, which acknowledged that the state had a continued responsibility for the welfare, basic welfare of people, can be seen in the kinds of policies that were continued after the 74 famine. So I don't think we can draw a line, a clear line, you know, here's the fourth famine and here's what happened. But I think no government wants to oversee another famine of that kind. And so they took measures. And I think the investment in agriculture and in the Green Revolution and all of that, and in, in making the Green Revolution adapted to the small scale farming in Bangladesh, I think that all must have had, you know, the disaster of the famine in mind. Nilanjan, uh, jump, to yeah. j jump in on this. It, it, in general, of course, what happens with these famines and sudden shocks is a realization comes upon a country that uh, you want to globalize, uh, you want to globalize, you want to have links running with the world. But there are some critical sectors mm -hmm. where you need to build buffers, so to speak, to be ready to take on if there is another, another shock. And you can mm -hmm. see this from around the world. Countries, United States stocks up fuel because it knows that, yes, it's a very, very globalized country, but one sector where if there is a sudden spike and shortage, there should be enough with the government so that it can release gas or fuel or yeah. petrol onto the yeah. market to stabilize. <laughs> India's food stocking policy started mm -hmm. with some of the early shocks that you realize that a certain amount of basic food. So I don't know the details, but I'm sure a shock like that just makes you aware that while you globalize, you have to remember that there are certain vital sectors where you need a buffer of self-sufficiency, yeah. which probably came about in Bangladesh as well. 
also worth noting, Koshik, is that when people write about Bangladesh and when they pick out things that it's done well on, one is disaster preparation, you know, being prepared for different kinds of disasters. Because of, obviously we are prone to more disasters than many. And in the past, a lot of lives have been lost by floods, famine, and so on. And I think that is a lesson, perhaps, that has also come up with independence. There have been some remarkable, actually, even in recent times, uh, protection against floods, etc. Bangladesh has made moves, which have been talked about indeed. Um, thank you. Uh, there is a comment. This is not a question, but I'll still read out the comment to you. Um, famine, led to, famine led to a social contract to attain food self-sufficiency. Opening up of market and liberalization of the agricultural sector led to food self-sufficiency. That's a comment. It's not a question. There is also a comment which says what a privilege it is to be able to pose questions to the two professors. So I thought I would let you know. Now, there are two other questions that I'm going to mention. Um, because as I said at the beginning, if this was an on-site event, these two uh, members of the audience would have had the chance to at least say their questions but they're not directly related to the conversation today. In fact, they're not related at all. So I will mention the content of the question, but it is not at all uh, essential to, to necessarily respond to it. One question concerns the environmental challenges to Bangladesh. Uh, do either of you have any comments on the environmental challenges to Bangladesh's development? Would either of you like to take that question or not? I, I'll just put in a comment that it is a huge challenge. One knows that and there is a lot of writing that Bangladesh has special vulnerabilities. But these are like so many things in life. The challenge comes from virtually beyond a nation, relatively small nation. It's a global situation that is causing it. You have to just, again, bring in the best minds, think in terms of all kinds of little measures. I remember at my time in the World Bank, visiting tiny islands in the Pacific. You're giving them suggestions about environmental changes and the dangers. There's nothing they can do to stop those big environmental changes taking place. Play their little role, but nothing more than that. But just building the right precautions, right, bringing in the best of technology, engineering techniques to take them on. And that is really what Bangladesh has to do. It's a it's a global matter where we will have to work together. Um, I absolutely, but I also think this is not one that Bangladesh can go alone. It is not the only, it is very vulnerable, but many, many countries are being asked to rethink their future, you know, growth and so on, without, uh, you know, what my late colleague Salim Hux talked about, uh, reparation, loss and damage. So I think this is an issue that Bangladesh should not expect to go alone on. This is a global challenge for many countries, and we have to be united in our response. I, I, I think there are many things that we in Bangladesh can do, um, and you know, how we how we change the way we do our energy, how we look after our trees instead of cutting them down, how you know, many, many smaller things that we can do, but there's a bigger story which I think has to be a much more united for all the countries that are suffering. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, there is one more question which I have just reread, and I want to say to the member of the audience from whom we did take a question earlier as well. This question, I'm not going to read out. It concerns the current big projects that are ongoing in Bangladesh. But I say this to the member of the audience who has posed this question. I hope you will understand that our not taking this question is because it actually has no connection with the content of the conversation today. And in fact, refers to contemporary politics in, in and political decisions in Bangladesh. And I think as, as chair of this event, I do think that uh, it is not correct for us to put our speakers in a position where they should be expected to comment on this kind of thing. But I hope you will understand. Uh, we've tried to accommodate almost all questions that have been asked today. Um, I'm now going to ask Javid one more time. Do you have one any question, any comment to make? Otherwise, I'll ask the uh, our two uh, professors to make closing comments. Um, uh, no, I, I don't have any questions, but I uh, must express my gratitude that 
very, very, um, we are very, very proud and honored that Professor Koshik Bushu and Professor Naila Kubi has given uh, much time to, uh, on this to discuss and enlighten us on the uh, on the country of Bangladesh that we love and we look forward for a flourishing and just Bangladesh. Um, so thank you very much. And I am very glad that you spent spare some of your valuable time for us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Professor Basu, anything by way of conclusion, even to go back to Sheikh Majib and his ideas? Not really, uh, Nilanjan. Uh, let me just uh, mention, uh, as I said in the start, there were those embryonic ideas in the writings, in the speeches of Sheikh Mujibur Rahman, which are worthwhile to remember. And we have to remember with enlightened minds that every detailed policy of our founding fathers in any country don't have to be right. But it is the spirit, the larger spirit of the for the country and for the world. We live in a small world today. Increasingly, we have to bring in the concern of the world to the table. Thank you very much for this opportunity. And Bangladesh, I have followed rather closely, visited several times. So it's very close to my heart and I share a language. So it's just wonderful for me to be able to participate in this. Naila? Uh, yes, I think... As someone who was a student in 1971, as someone who uh, became a, you know, a professional over that period, as someone who really was very aware of how Bangladesh was positioned in reality, but also in the world's imagination as this country that was hopeless, that there was no future. I think we can commend ourselves that we've done unexpectedly well on the things that matter. And by that, I do mean the human development and the social progress along with the growth. But I do also see, and I think uh, Koshik is pointing it out in a very, uh, very comforting way, but there are huge challenges ahead with technology, with globalization and so on. So I hope we manage and that the government manages to bring the best minds together and bring the people together to make sure that we are prepared for the challenges ahead. Thank you very much. Um, it is now my very pleasant duty to thank all of you. Um, Koshik Basu, who's Karl Marx Professor of International Relations at Cornell University. Naila Kabir, who's Professor of Gender and Development at LSE and is also Associate Faculty at the International Inequalities Institute here at the LSE. And Ahmed Javed Chaudhry, who's Founder and Chairperson of Bangar Patshala Foundation and Assistant Professor in Economics at City University in Dhaka, without whose initiative, actually, we would not have begun this series. I do want to thank Koshik Basu, who initially put uh, Bangar Patshala Foundation in touch with the LSE South Asia Center. So thank you very much for that, for in making that, that initial uh, introduction. Um, I also want to thank uh, Koshik Basu and Naila Kabir, because I say this at the end of every event that we do, um, you know, we do we events almost every week, that if there's anything good that has come out of the pandemic, it is that we've all become a bit more technologically <laughs> savvy and learned how to use Zoom. And what it has allowed us to do is to create these kinds of literally global conversations, acro literally across time zones, um, with, with virtually very little cost. And uh, But we are entirely reliant on the generosity of your time and of your expertise and the generosity with which you give your expert knowledge uh, to all of us from which we learn. So thank you very much. And we do hope that we will carry on these conversations to members of the audience. Please follow the South Asia Center on various social media platforms or check our website. And thank you once again. And uh, we will be in touch. Uh, Professor Koshik Basu, Professor Naila Kabir, and Ahmed Javid Chaudhary. Goodbye. Bye. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.